Yeah, I have been listening, you know, for last half an hour. I think there are a lot of things about heavy metals and recovery and uh, addition of elements and all. So uh, we are from a little bit different uh, field. We are the instrumentation supplier, and uh, we are representing a, a famous Japanese company, Shimadzu, uh, which is dealing into this kind of. So they are into uh, different kind of uh, instruments, like from chemical analysis to surface analysis. Uh, so different kind of material testing. Uh, in today's presentation, I'll try to cover the basically the chemical composition uh, and one of the instrument I think which is uh, being widely used already. But my presentation will try to cover you know what are the new developments into this technique. So I hope it will be of interest. Uh, so basically, you know, if you see our product range right now, I am from Performex Analytical and uh, basically 30 years background of uh, instrumentation. So all uh, chemical composition instruments like XRF, uh, optical emission spectrometers, uh, XPS, uh, which is a very famous instrument right now in India, and it is uh, recently we installed one at IIT for top 10 nanometer analysis basically of the material. Uh, we have atomic force microscope, EPMA and then physical characterization instruments. So basically we have a full range of machines if you want to analyze your product. Talk about the geology application, you know typically everybody were talking about you know of course you to uh, value your product you want to check what are the elements presence, what are the compositions. Uh, what are the contamination if we talk about the uh, geology, what are the foreign particle analysis and the heavy metal analysis. Yeah, so uh, one of the instrument which is now getting popular is EDXRF though it is there in the field for many years but there are some latest development. Everybody knows WDXRF, EDXRF. I will talk about the EDXRF normally people know you know it fits onto the scanning electron microscope and it is used for the elemental analysis. Uh, yeah, but it is an expensive machine, you know, it is time consuming, you have to make a sample preparation and you require a very trained chemist to do this. And it typically if you want a quick analysis, you know, this is not the instrument, this is a research instrument basically. So then subsequently, you know, maybe about 20 years back, you know, this kind of tabletop machine came in where there was no electron microscopy, only the elemental analyzer. It was a very low power and uh, it was basically used for uh, petrochemical applications, typically for analyzing sulphur and chlorine, not for the geology. So now recently if you see about you know maybe 15 years back now we have this kind of machines uh, you know more robust and uh, you know the specifications are quite higher and this can be used for geology applications. So it is a very simple instrument hardware wise you have a x-rays a source uh, you have a sample chamber where you put the sample and x-rays are uh, bombarded onto the sample and then you have a detector. So hardware wise very simple technique. Uh, sir, nowadays the uh, sensitivity is quite uh, good. We, we yeah, but now sir, it's almost now five years, so we have improved our performance. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, right now the sensitivity goes even to one ppm, so it's quite good. Yeah, <clears throat> so very simple uh, configuration, tabletop design. So, if you see, you know, just to uh, brief about the technology, you have an X-ray tube, uh, like you can, you can see, it is bombarded onto the sample. Sample is having uh, aluminium, chromium, lead, and cadmium. So those elements are getting excited and it generates a secondary X-rays, the detector measures it based on the energy value. In XRF sir, you will get only total aluminium. Yeah, so based on the energy value, every element has a fixed energy value. So like for example, if there is a, a peak coming on to 1.487 uh, electron volt, it is identified as uh, aluminium and the height of the peak is proportional to the concentration. That is how the machine recognizes the element and the concentration. Sir, everything now XRF uh, like we have about 300 machines in India and unfortunately none in cement. So, <laughs> so it is going in very. Uh, yeah, and uh, normally for them, you know, only few elements are sufficient. They go for a lower end XRF. This is a slightly higher end. So typically, what it can do is qualitative analysis. Normally, as you know, any spectrometer it requires calibration. Now this technology even if you put unknown sample as it is, you will get a qualitative what are the elements present as it is without having any calibration. The software also provides you the approximate concentrations. Uh, it is a of course qualitative analysis very easy based on the energy value. If you are getting a pick, it says okay there is an element present. Uh, there are no overlapping energy signatures uh, in qualitative is a basic qualitative. There will be overlapping because uh, but at least you get some information. We know even put an absolute unknown sample you get to know. Then
Actually, sir, I didn't know, you know, people are there from other IITs because IITs now, as you said, is getting a lot of fund and in fact, these are very basic instrument. They all are going for XPS now. So, XPS does a lot of things apart from elemental analysis, you get uh, imaging, uh, depth profiling, you know, chemical state. So, you get a semi quantitative analysis as well without calibration and of course, if you do calibration, you get quantitative, the same machine can do coating thickness measurement. Yeah, and uh, now I think I hear a lot of things about the heavy metal. Now, this machine is quite popular for analyzing heavy metals. So, like for example, WEEE ROHS ELV, now it is all being implemented in India by all electronics and automotive companies. So, uh, this is our ideal equipment, you have EN71 and the toys and ICS Q3D is a recent introduction by pharmaceuticals where you know the limits are 1 ppm where we are selling this machine. So, if when you have absolute uh, unknown sample, you just put it into the machine and it will scan right from sodium to uranium and whatever the elements are present into it, it will give you in spectra followed by the elemental names. And then into a, if you do not have a calibration, it uh, generates a semi quantitative analysis method and it produces this kind of uh, composition information. Because if you want a very precise analysis, you make a calibration by using non samples like this kind of calibration curve and uh, it is a linearity curve. It can do anything, solid, powder, liquid, anything. Uh, does not matter. So, basically here you can see, uh, you know it can the detection limits are from sodium to uranium. So, entire range of elements can be tested, there is no limitation, only we are missing some of the lighter elements, otherwise everything is possible. Uh, the sample preparation is not must, uh, you know you can say like here you can see like for ROHS heavy metals, like even wires and telephones and everything directly they have put in and they have analyzed. And uh, sample types are not an issue, you can put solid like I have put on some uh, rock samples straight away you can put in and uh, of course, if you grind it you get a better uh, consistency liquid sample. It can be in fabricated you know beads, pellets, films, curves, anything straight away you can put in and uh, of course, analysis time is for typically few minutes, uh, it depends on what concentration we are looking at. It is a very big chamber, so even if you have a bigger sample, uh, you can straight away put in and uh, you know it reduces the sample preparation time. Yeah, detection limit depends on of course, the elements, but uh, right now we are working on right from 1 ppm onwards. So, as you go higher is no problem, lower is a problem in XRF. So, 1 ppm we have achieved all heavy elements we are doing in from 1 ppm. So, it is basically non-destructive. Non ICP of course, is good if you are talking about less than ppm. So, above ppm now people are preferring EDXRF. ICP is good for a PPB analysis. Yeah, correct. Normally, geology sample will be in percentages. So, this is sufficient. No, no, these are truly total element, that is it. INA can all you have to go for different instruments. No, 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 it is all total element, that is it. Also, what we are using a camera here. So, even if you have a non homogeneous sample, you can pinpoint the you know spot where you want to analyze. And so, if we have different choice 1 mm, 3 mm, 5 and 10 mm. So, rock samples which are normally not homogeneous, you can pinpoint a different spot and you can analyze looking at the camera. Yes, and then even you can do do the overlapping overlapping of the spectra. Yeah. yeah, same thing you can do. But EDS, you know, original electron spot itself is very small. Here you are, you can do the bulk analysis because the spot size is 10 mm. So, you get a better result. You know, EDS is not accurate actually, it is a semi quantitative analysis, this is quite accurate. Yes. It will not be in micron or you know very small mm like electron, but here it is 1 mm is a minimum. Electron probe analysis. Yeah, but those are sir, typically electron probe and EPM if you are referring these are all very very small micron spot because electron is uh, very small. Here we are talking about the bulk analysis and uh, the biggest advantage it has a initial cost, but the running cost is peanuts you know what consumable you require is a uh, mylar films. So, we just typically cost per sample about 2 to 3 rupees. So, absolutely running cost is nothing. Just to brief about the heavy metal analysis, of course, you know I think everybody knows the uh, source of the contamination. Finally, you know one of the application like where we have sold maximum you use any like television or the mobile phone in India, all companies are using our this machine. So, uh, all the parts uh, basically when you scrap your mobile phone or something it finally goes into uh, you know the environment and it affects. So, these machines are very popular for that. Maximum 10 minutes, minimum is about even like for example, this is also popular for gold analysis. So, if you are doing it in the percentage, about few seconds are sufficient 20 seconds, 30 seconds. So, unless it is a non homogeneous, then you crush it and make it powder, otherwise, you can put as it is. So, uh, of course, acceptable limits are ppm, so that is why this is sufficient for heavy metal analysis. And uh, 
easy to operate you know it doesn't require a chemist to operate basically straight away you put the sample and uh, machine does the rest quite quick you know as the timing has a no pre treatment and no gases or chemicals just a power what you require to start it yeah experience actually uh, i want to learn why don't maybe uh, just out of the what subject x-ray photo electron spectrometer is a uh, electron and basically it does analysis of 10 <coughs> uh, the top layer of 10 nanometer so if you have like for example corrosion you know and if you want to study the corrosion of course xp is the only technique so you know you have a electron bombarding onto the surface just penetrated only 10 nanometer and then you study the uh, electron you know basically you get the x-ray output x-ray you study and you can do imaging you can do compound analysis chemical analysis electron okay. So, if I give you a sand grain coated with something, yes. you can analyze it. Yeah, very much. And even what it does with electron, it does the depth profiling. Even if you want to measure the thickness of the coating, it will, you know, electron will keep penetrating by removing the material layer by layer. And you can study, you know, inside how is the, uh, you know, the surface basically. So, you can characterize surface by surface. Say, chemist option, if you want to study. Yeah, it's a truly R&D idea. Study what is the penetration of the chemicals inside the material. So many times around the top is different uh, in the you know depth it is different. So you can keep removing the layer by layer and you can study what is happening. Yeah, well typically talk about the nanometers, you know. So you typically talk about hundred nanometers. Surface. <coughs> yep. So good uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, um, I am Munish Chindel, I work here at IIT Bombay, in, uh, not in civil department, but in Center for Environmental Science and Engineering. So, uh, you know, uh, I work largely on solid waste management, uh, waste to energy, life cycle analysis, all related to the solid waste management. Then I have some other interest on greenhouse gas mitigation and climate change related issues. Uh, for today, I am, for, for example, he has said we should talk about research, proposed research areas, so I am proposing landfill mining. But largely, if you look into our uh, waste, municipal solid waste, which is uh, generated for many years now, so far we haven't treated it at all. So that means what we have done so far, we have just dumped it. We have uh, no liner in the bottom. We have, for many, most of cases, we have no cover actually. So it's just lying and it's polluting our air and water and actually land also because there is no control. And another part which many of you already know, for example, in Mumbai, almost every year we get uh, fire in our landfills, except the last year was a little bit lucky. So if I start telling you what we get when there is a fire, trust me, many of you would think of leaving Mumbai because they are really carcinogenic products we are producing. And then you look, there is no liner, so everything in terms of uh, whatever it contains, heavy metals, all kind of toxic substances, they go to the groundwater and then maybe to the sea in, in case of Mumbai and maybe to other even to surface water in other parts of the country. And then Delhi's Gajipur is another example where first we thought of landslides but we have now waste slides also. I don't know what's the right term for that, maybe just slide land which even people are getting killed for that. So interestingly what our rule says that we have to look, we have to in a sense deal with these open dump sites and actually we have to go for biomining. Um, I don't understand this biomining to be very honest but anyway we have to do landfill mining. So uh, in addition to that because now we are generating a lot of more waste because we have more population. Uh, and you know, it's uh, as for one study by Ministry of Finance, we, if you look into the waste generated from 2009 and up to 2047, we would need 1400 square kilometer of extra land to put that waste if we are doing what we are doing so far. So that land is unfortunately not available because already our, all our landfills are filled. So even forgetting about the best technology, even if we just want to dump it, still we need more land. So, and then we say about smart city, we cannot have a smart city when our, all our cities have a waste, open dumps inside the cities. And then you can understand we need a lot of resources, so then there's a concept of circular economy. So what we, so that means we have to take care of this waste and probably do the landfill mining or actually just take it away from the cities. So we started to look into what people has done or what has happened in India largely in terms of landfill mining. There are very few studies done, 
But if you look into most of them, actually most of them what they say is that we can just do the segregation into coarser and finer and this finer material can be used as a compost, which I will tell you is not a good idea in my uh, couple of slides later. So there is very interesting uh, uh, presentation by the Zigma Global, which they have presentation in the morning. What they have done in Tamil Nadu is they were able to segregate the material into 14 categories and could send it to cement, pyrolysis plant, recycler, reclaimer, etc. Please, we have experts from the company itself, so don't ask me how they did it, just ask them. But interestingly, if you look into the, the what they are doing with their waste, most of the study says that they should be able to compost it, that is the only solution, but if you look into that, only 6% of that is probably used as soil enricher. So that's another thing which we have to see. So in our understanding, there are three reasons for landfill mining, waste to energy, plays when we saying waste to energy, Actually, we can produce some energy because some part of it is combustible in nature. Uh, around 30 to 40 percent of this material can be combustible. But when we say waste to energy, don't think that it will generate extra revenue. It will offshoot some of your capital and operational cost. Okay? And then waste to energy, waste to materials, that's interesting. We can recycle materials, we can use it for compost and probably for building materials, but there are many ifs and buts related to that. And to me, most of important is the white space generation because anyway, we have to take care of this space because there is no liner over that. So that means we have to even remove it at first place and then put a liner if we want to put it back also. Otherwise, it's, it's not a good idea. So in that process, if we can take some material out of the cities, probably making space for the more waste which is will come in terms of even when we have sanitary landfill. Other than that, in terms of recycling and combustible, we have to see, it, we have to think a lot about this. So we started, we started to do some preliminary studies. We started just last year. Uh, we took the land, uh, Mulund dump yard. It's uh, one of the old uh, sites, one of the major sites uh, in Mumbai, approximately 25 hectares. And it takes approximately 4,500 metric tons of waste every day. And if you look into how close the people live, it's just 200 feet away from the from the site, there are habitation actually. It's not necessary that uh, the, the people moved, uh, it's not that the site was, the site was earlier, the people moved to the site actually, it's, which is not the case always by the way. So it's not necessarily the government's fault because for many years there was, this land was empty, so slowly people start moving towards that, that's why so they're so close. Uh, go to the next slide. So we have uh, different zones and from preliminary studies we have done is the particle size distribution. If you look into the most of, uh, most of these places which has waste as old as 10 years, approximately 50% of that has actually fine aggregates. It's less than 4 millimeter in size. So that's what probably many times people say that it can be used as a compost or as an alternate of coast. Some material is, of course, then there are different sizes. Once the age increases, this becomes more and uh, more and more fine because of the degradation which is happening place. So for example, site B, uh, the B1 and B2 uh, is a little bit of the fresh paste. So then you can see that the, the finer particles are size, uh, the distribution is a little bit on lesser side. Then, when coming back to then what people are saying uh, is that we can use it as a compost. If you look into the heavy metal concentration, all of, I would say most of these places, even what we have not shown here, all the places have high concentration of heavy metals. So actually by, even if we consider that it can be a equivalent to a compost, actually it cannot be until unless we remove these toxic heavy metals because it doesn't fulfill the Indian standard requirements. So that's a important question which need to be answered before actually it goes to our agriculture farms. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one question, how we can remove those heavy metals, what kind of technologies can be taken place. And if we are saying that some of it materials can be used for combustion and produce some energy, that's another thing. And if we want to recycle, what kind of materials can be recycled, you know, it's, to me it's like we can do many things, but then it will probably come towards the cost and maybe some kind of technology we have to fit which technology is suitable for this. So to summarize, uh, probably we have to look for landfill mining, no matter what. It, 
will not be a cost making, it will not be a benefit making process, we have to look into the cost, it's people has to pay or government has to pay anyway, whatever is this. If we are saying in terms of recovery, we have to see the age characteristics, technologies, as I mentioned, for example, people say bio mining, but if in my opinion, if the waste is 10, 15 year old, it's already bio mined. So it's already processed, what you can do with that? I don't think it will, bio mining is a good term for that. Uh, 50% of material is fine fraction. It probably can be used as a soil conditioner. I don't know how it can be used in, in the construction because when I was civil engineer, of course I'm still civil engineer, but people told that organic matter should be zero. But now we are saying we have soil mixed with organic matter, etc., and it can be used in agri uh, for construction purpose. I, we have to see that actually. It's not gonna be that easy. So then the question is what the environmental implications and the biggest challenge probably is going to be the cost. Other than that, we are looking for what technologies in terms of valorization can be economically and environmentally friendly. You mean uh, there may be some kind of leachating happening? Of course, of course. Uh, stable at one place. Yes. Yeah. In the confined and unconfined group. Yeah. So, and you are also showing that there are three ways of doing land mining hmm. and both the three ways are not fit good. So what are the environmental evaluation criteria you are going to look for the landfill mining? That is the last uh, point you have made. Economic and environmental evaluation. What is your idea about that? Which parameter you do? Yeah, so I am not showing that there are three ways of doing but I am saying that there are three reasons for doing it. So it is going to be one process and then you can do it. As far as I, I think that we have to certainly look for, for example, for all kinds of environmental criteria if we are using it as a compost. If you want to use it as construction materials, we need to look into all civil engineering related issues. If there is a problem, we that need to be resolved. No matter what you, we can say theoretically anything, but people won't accept it as a construction material or as a compost. Those who are saying it's a compost, they don't understand this or they are not doing it correctly. As far as I, we, we are concerned, we shouldn't use it as a compost. It has heavy metal. It is. Interestingly, some of other countries, even in USP, US EPA, some of the standards are even less stringent than what we have. Then, for example, what uh, Charles was saying, for example, if you want to, to develop some kind of specific non-edible material, non-agriculture -agri things, probably there we can use. But so far, we don't have any standards. And then, up to, up to the point it comes, we actually have to follow the agriculture standards. What you're saying, what aquifer they has they been gone to, you mean that have been leached to the aquifer? Certainly, you look into all open dumps across the country, you know better than me probably. All of them are contaminated, there is no doubt about it. But that's why we probably have to do it now, otherwise it will keep on uh, continuing for many years actually. Uh, one is the conversion of ERTGC. Previously, port ERTGC is based on diesel. Now all these are this is converted in uh, uh, electricity. Second, uh, port initiated a solar power plant. Uh, in uh, September 2016, we initiated a uh, 822 uh, kilowatt uh, power plant. Uh, port planning for a 25 megawatt of power project. This is in planning stage. Uh, third initiative is a CNG based uh, stations in inside port and outside port. This proposal at the uh, approach. Uh, fourth uh, project related with the soil contamination study of the port. This work uh, contributed by sir. Uh, another uh, some projects related would be uh, currently we are monitoring environmental parameters via manual methods. But uh, in uh, uh, after February 2018, we are going to in, uh, monitoring environmental parameters uh, uh, online basis. Another uh, one uh, project, uh, in January 2018, uh, Port Commission for uh, MLD with uh, wastewater treatment plan. And uh, other training part and other some initiative we have initiated. Well, what do you do with your uh, MSW? <coughs> yes. Both inside and outside the port. Yes. Uh, around 2 metric ton uh, well generated in the uh, port area. Uh, currently, uh, port don't have uh, such uh, advanced technology, but uh, in next two three months, port uh, uh, are going to tendering for the uh, solid waste project. Yeah.
Because they are under this green port. Uh, green green line. Line. Okay. <coughs> No, they are not having any landfill as, as of date. But the issues are two inside the port and outside the port. So, yes. you can you explain a bit more what are your initiatives regarding this? Inside the port, like vessels and all this, and you know, handling part. Uh, this is continuing import, that's why uh, not uh, more of waste generated from the inside port area, but mainly waste generated from the uh, township area. Because around uh, one ton plus uh, waste generated daily from the township area. And you know, vessel waste also we receive from the vessels. Is there any national consultant here in India I mean, which uh, gives uh, design for secure land? So, Babu is there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. hmm? But, uh, for the recent uh, mega cities or this smart cities. You see, there was one called Tarzagi. There was one called Tarzagi. Tarzagi. Okay. Who is the father of our subject? Yes. Yeah. Now, in landfill also, now there are a lot of people who are working in this area. Mm -hmm. They are the modern day Tarzagi. Yeah. yeah. No, actually, I want to tell you, you know, even the site selections are wrong. Yeah. Huh? And uh, there is a way of even trying to say that if the selected site is already wrong, you have to take some remedial actions because the municipal uh, authorities are under some pressure. Select, yeah, you know, they they just just random selections are there. So you have to do on risk mapping considerations, like uh, you have methods. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am. Uh, Right now, serving as assistant professor at uh, NIT Suratkal, and uh, <coughs> yes, as Professor Singh has uh, like uh, rightly pointed out, uh, in the process of development of uh, the uh, one of the laboratory, like that is sustainable construction and building materials laboratory. The, the research is more onto the sustainability. Well, I'm 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 a concrete technologist, so my research more into the sustainable utilization of the industrial byproducts. Well, uh, it is very, very d difficult, like we also go for a brainstorming like uh, sessions on how we can define the sustainable solution, but it is difficult to define, but we are attempting okay, to uh, go for the sustainability, like uh, uh, more into the utilization part. So considering the sustainable utilization of industrial byproducts in concrete, uh, well, uh, well, like uh, uh, I I'm, I'm really feel like uh, fortunate like or uh, feel myself very lucky okay, to uh, uh, well, Mangalore is a very, very much uh, industrial like uh, city, and a lot of kind of waste are getting generated. I, 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 I wish, I, I think, like uh, I don't know, like what is the exact source, but I think there are many waste are coming into Mangalore, and they are getting like uh, recycled, like uh, petroleum, some petroleum industries. Petroleum industry yes, petroleum yes, yes. yeah, yeah. MRP like uh, yes, biggest, biggest, yes. So you can see like there are uh, variety of waste are like available, bottom mass is available, battery waste is available, plenty of waste, battery waste available, e-waste is a huge amount, coconut sellers, like question note sellers, flyers, GG waste, so even the, the list is like um, uh, very large. So lot of varieties of waste uh, we are getting a chance okay, to the uh, successful utilization. Well like the, the biggest challenge for the industry is like everybody is looking into the a single entity that is compressive strength. Uh, so we are now need to define what is the long term sustainability like. <coughs> so th that is the one we are simultaneously working with the compressive strength, the permeability and durability studies for the concrete. Yeah, if you can really, I have given this like plot, like if you see the particle distribution of the various kind of waste uh, where we have a chance, so got a chance to uh, work with. Yeah, the particle size uh, is uh, mostly like is the river sand is there and it is mostly very much similar or one or two or very coarser, but it is very much similar. So it can be definitely sustainably like utilized. Yeah, battery slug means uh, they, the, all the batteries which are getting dead after five, six years, they are uh, bringing into Mangalore and Coimbatore there are two, they have two plants, uh, they are private farms. So they, they recycle it and extract the lead from there. And the residue, they uh, means they, they, he was telling me like if uh, he wants to send it to landfill to Bangalore, 
or he has to pay, he is paying 4 crores. So, uh, he asked me for the shell of the battery or what is it? Uh, yeah, it is outer cell. Yeah, outer cell, outer, of, the outer cell of the batteries. Yes, the cars, uh, the vehicles, oh, the have all kind of batteries. Yeah. So, so, so the biggest challenge is whatever the waste you are going to utilize. Uh, the challenge is the uh, well, the, the the moment you use uh, most of the waste are acidic in nature. So, uh, so you you it is difficult okay to uh, to replace it okay directly. So you have to judiciously. So, these are the fundamental tests like uh, we have done, well the strength is basically not okay much uh, like uh, appreciative like so what you can do actually we, we have to look for some alternate ideas. So, there the idea comes like how we had uh, how you need to go ahead or I uh, need to uh, like uh, uh, add other technologies like uh, we talk about the bio, uh, like uh, MICB micro uh, bio induced uh, calcite precipitation then uh, there are many things I have listed it. So, uh, this is the one of the uh, beautiful research like uh, you know, uh, one of my masters uh, by research student has done it. So, sustainable wastewater concrete technology. Now, Mangalore being a uh, declared a smart city, it is good okay like the city is taking initiative like how to utilize the even the wastewater. So, if you see the wastewater like uh, one of my uh, other colleague is uh, taking uh, the helping me with me like helping me in this project like uh, first job is we have to ascertain this has to meet the standards like uh, if you see the Indian standard is specifying when the STM is specifying any like what you water you are going to use uh, in concrete that has to be like uh, like a tap water like it, it has some characteristics. So, we, we are making ascertain like yes this water is absolutely fine. It is a treated one, treated, treated waste water from the, from the domestic, this is domestic one, yeah. yes, domestic sewage, yes, yes, the sewage, yeah. So, so what we did actually here, like uh, uh, the same problem, the problem is it is slightly SD. So, what we did actually, we uh, like uh, we added okay the MICP that is bacteria into the uh, waste water and then they added okay, the concrete. Oh, so see, you can see the right side okay, the blue ones, the strength okay, we have regained. Okay, like, so, th this can be definitely used as a uh, sustainable solution. Like, so, there are some advanced characters also is very well satisfying okay, the uh, criteria yes, for the concrete hydration. Yeah, so, the challenges actually like one of the challenges you can see the optimized utilization of industrial byproducts that is the biggest challenge for us. How we are going to use well, 10 percent is not okay enough, okay, 20 is not enough. So, we have to go like how much we can utilize. Now, maybe okay, you need to go ahead with some additives. Yes, we are going ahead with fillers, maybe some activation techniques is very well required. We, yes, we are going ahead with bio cementation, even we are going to the nano cementation like we, we are uh, recently we are doing some research on the infusing some nanoparticles <coughs> in a uh, solid form and a dispersion like liquid form and checking okay like what is the um, advantage like we are getting. Then yes, we are also using the some phase change materials for thermal stability. Yes, now the second part we are doing on the su sustainable production of artificial aggregates. Now, well, the 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 way now we are discussing now the challenges of the for the environmental like uh, environment challenges. See, after certain time, we will definitely be in a stage where right now the mining of sand is completely banned in most of the states. So, we are completely dependent on the M sand or, or we are going with some uh, other like substitutes. So, similarly like I feel like certain point of time government will say yes you cannot okay also carry the coarse aggregates that is which contains around 50 60 percentage. So, <coughs> with this in mind like well the lot of people are doing research. So, we, I also started the, the working development of the uh, artificial aggregates from the industrial byproducts. So, how we are doing it like we are uh, using industrial byproducts uh, uh, like using other techniques like uh, activation like uh, alkalination and producing the aggregates. It is very much successful and uh, the challenges. Yeah, so, if you can see the preliminary work uh, uh, with this work we are able to successfully develop the variety of sizes. So, next slide, next yes. Yeah. So, you can see uh, if you do the sieve analysis, we can go up, we can develop the coarser fractions and also the finer like fractions. So, we can successfully produce the coarse aggregates and so the fine aggregate. 
Well, this is uh, the work we are not uh, published, so we are thinking of what to do. Then <coughs> now, now the, what are the challenges? The challenges is matching the characteristics of naturally available aggregates. That is the biggest challenge. Now, the second challenge is degree of surface smoothness or measurable surface roughness. This is a, another biggest challenge. Then bond characteristics. Then we, we are working on a uh, uh, theme like that is encapsulation of waste. Can we encapsulate the waste? into the aggregate uh, we, we are working on it i don't know i don't have answer right now then the the biggest challenge of the morning i was taking technology transfer how you want to transfer the technology and the last is the acceptability the society has to accept you want to have some aggregates uh, which match the building construction standards yes sir no other our point is to have some material which has some stiffness and strength yes sir why you should you bother about aggregate sizes and characteristics uh, sir, uh, means we need uh, the aggregates with specific. What I, my question yeah. is, that we are looking at strength and stiffness parameters. Yes, yes, yes. And we want some mixed design. But I mean, I just want like, you know, nowadays you have in, uh, say, for aggregate in road construction. Yeah, yeah. In place of it, you can simply have a some other material which has equal stiffness and uh, resilience sir. and all. Sir, sir. Why are you doing with all this, you know, because they are time taking. In fact, mixing and all of this. If you have a magic of having a required stiffness and strength, then it's okay. Yeah, but sir, we, we need the uh, coarser fractions, even for the… Why uh, do you need animals? Yeah. Uh, workability, we are used to it. Okay, yeah, not necessarily. Like, coarser fraction takes the maximum strength, okay. absorbs maximum strength. That's okay. I mean, yeah. I'm just talking about… See, yeah, use your point also, I, I really… No, my only yeah. thing is, many of these materials, the yeah. gradation <laughs> characteristics are the most complex in uh, particulate materials. Yes. The yes. gradation characteristics are very complex. Yes. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you an answer for yeah. that because if, if you don't do the right gradation for aggregates, it's fine, you will still get a concrete. It may not be really workable. We can throw in admixtures and we can still get stuff done. But the problem is if you don't optimize the aggregate gradation, you'll have to put in more cement to fill in the space. More cement, more shrinkage, more cracking, all those things. I mean, see, then I'm just only trying to look at a uh, material which has stiffness equal strength and stiffness and which can be, you know, say, I mean, because, uh, I mean, there is one different uh, argument that, you know, if you have a particulate system, you have more variability. Okay. More mixing and more other so issues. instead of putting an aggregate, you can have, why not have a pan? Final fraction. Some, some other, no, no, some other stiffness and strength. No, that's what, because, see, I mean, we work on probabilistic, variability is the most complex thing. If you are trying to work with graded, graded, gap graded, like you can say, but if you are able to, Bring a cohesive matrix which gives you only your you know, performance based designs of strength and stiffness. What you are looking at? Yeah, or durability the, and repeat, whatever you want. Somebody has to make that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a question of optimization. Yeah, optimization. That's, all, that's what I want. Exactly. Whatever. Yeah. If you can get something else to put under the road bed that is stiff. That's it. That's it. That's Absolutely fine. What would you get cheaper than? All the that, course all aggregate. That, yeah. All that. I mean, because yeah. uh, sometimes if you are looking at our objectives of uh, getting a gradation, then the final objective, as I said, cost and economics and sections should be borne in mind along with this. Right. For a road base, I wouldn't mind. But for concrete, okay. um, if you want the right characteristics in, the, in terms of durability, in terms of reduction permeability, in terms of shrinkage, Think degree, gradation becomes extremely important. Okay. So, no, no question about that. Uh, <coughs> if you say that uh, in India, in the context, the level of water is a random character of water is a as well as the material will be very much different. So, like, uh, how do you think that like, your technique will be capable to take care of these uncertainties if we want to use it in India or if we do some modification, uh, which is like, uh, which will obtain some uh, extra research? Uh, obviously, the, the maximum uh, can be issued because you, you, need, you need a contrast between the background. Uh, background and uh, after damage productivity and uh, the whatever you're trying to be contaminated, but I don't think you, you can reach that high level uh, practically anywhere in the world anyways. In terms of the minimum, obviously, the more you clean up, the lower the, lower the uh, concentration of the contaminants will, the more problem you will have and, and, and that, but, uh, and then, then the absorption to the part of the solid porous media that you have specifically the way we should be. But in terms of the maximum, I don't think practically there would be an issue. Now granted this this would probably be a technique mostly used for